Okay, as we um, we're ready to start, um, or before we start, uh, I wanted to remind the chat members to please uh, use your microphones and make sure you're close enough. We some of the people on the the webcast are having trouble hearing, and I I should turn this off, but. For the people in the audience, please help yourselves to some uh, uh, Halloween treats. <laughs> Sorry about the people on watching on on the web. Well, the, our lab keeps promising they're going to get down the um, you know beaming things from place to building to building, things and people. I haven't heard any progress reports lately. Should I begin? Please proceed. All right, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Serge Daskopta. Uh, I'm from Versar, and today I will be talking about Versar's efforts uh, in determining scenario-based aggregate phthalate uh, exposures to humans. Um, I'm going to briefly talk about uh, the contents of my presentation. I'm going to provide a uh, really quick, uh, you know, the objective and background of this particular project. Um, then I'm going to do a re quick recap of where we were in the previous CHAP meeting and, and you know, the, the work that we've done so far. Next, I will be uh, showing some of the Excel workbooks that we have created uh, for pregnant women and women of childbearing age. And these uh, spreadsheets of workbooks, there are three of them. Um, and they include the concentrations, the exposure factors, and then the final uh, exposure calculations. Um, next, I'll be briefly talking about the results. Um, and then, have a short discussion about our ongoing efforts with infants and children. And finally, um, you know, the things that yet to be accomplished. Can I make a One of the things that we're most concerned about are the results that you have for the women of childbearing age. And I think we spend more time on that and less time on other things. We can always go back and fill in some of the gaps. I don't want to spend time on the details of all the calculations. I'd rather spend time on the results because we, we had a bit of a conversation at lunch indicating that's where we need to start focusing our attention. Is that correct, Chris? Yeah. Just to put it into a frame of reference. So the results are where we want your attention being paid because we're going to start looking at it in terms of some of the things that have been done in the biomonitoring data to compare the milligrams per kilogram per day for both means and the high end. So in that way, you know where our focus is, okay? All right, thanks, Paul. Yeah, I think what I'm going to do then is I can talk about the few slides and then I'll skip showing the, the Excel spreadsheets because I kind of did that before. I can directly move on to the results and I'm sure that, you know, when questions come up, we can revert back to the, the spreadsheets. That's perfect. I mean, in that way, then you've taken your time using it effectively and people need to have follow-up and back backfill of information, you're always free to go backwards. Okay, okay. thank you. All right, um, so the overall objective of this project is to estimate, you know, aggregate human exposures. Uh, we were given a list of eight phthalates, and the, the way to do that for this particular project was mm -hmm. to analyze individual human exposures to the variety, to the various median sources. And, and to come up with an aggregate estimate of exposures to phthalates across several subpopulations. Um, so this graphic over here kind of, I think, provides a good overall, you know, pictorial representation of the, what, 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 what I'd like to call like the three-dimensional problem that we have over here. So we have phthalates interacting with a variety of sources slash media and then you have all the, the different exposure routes. And again, on top are the different uh, subpopulations and, and how each of these parameters, if you might call it, you know, interact with each other. That's the, the real significant uh, challenge of this particular project. 
a quick recap. Uh, Versar started working on this project with, with uh, CPSC uh, back in Je June of 2011. We presented some really pr preliminary results in um, the, f the, the, the first CHAP meeting that we had, which was in July. And uh, at that time, CHAP you know, members were mainly interested in looking at some of the uh, uncertainty, variability, and sensitivity of the data that, that we talked about, mainly as it related to the exposure factors. Uh, so far, we have completed all the analysis for the first subpopulation that we started with, which is pregnant women and women of childbearing age, and we have roughly, we've completed roughly about 50% uh, for infants, toddlers, and children, and, and they were two separate categories, but we've combined them together and we are proceeding with them as if they're like, you know, one. Um, so, so that's where we stand so far. Um, the Excel workbooks, the way they're organized are the concentrations. The concentrations uh, workbook has all the concentration for all the phthalates that we determined from our literature research, and it includes seven uh, exposure outs. Um, and it's not like we have concentrations for all phthalates. It is whatever we found was you know, pertinent or relevant to that particular media or, or route. And that kind of carries through to the, uh, the exposure factors. The exposure factors were primarily uh, compiled from the, the, the 2009 uh, Exposure Factors Handbook, uh, which uh, you know, was uh, published by EPA. But besides that, we've also done a lot of you know, research and looked at various other sources to come up with these factors. And, and these are basically the, the behavioral or, uh, or the human activities that, that need to be studied along with the concentrations to determine these overall uh, phthalate exposures. Finally, the, the, the workbook that has the, the, the calculations, it has calculations, uh, est exposure estimates for individual phthalates, and it also has aggregate numbers, and, and I can show you that uh, a little later. All right, so I'm not going to get into the spreadsheets. I'm directly going to move on to the results and discussions. One thing that I'd like to uh, just point out before I start is that um, I know that one of the concerns was you know, the, about the variability and the sensitivity of the data. And we have tried to address that a little bit, and, and you will see that in the subsequent uh, uh, graphs and charts. Um, this table shows the aggregate exposures to the eight phthalates that we have. I think this is not bright enough or something. Uh, yeah. I, I can actually open up the spreadsheet that has that. Um, so what I have here are the total uh, daily exposures to, to pregnant women from all the sources and all the exposure routes for eight phthalates. And the distinction between the two, one is without concentrations and the other one is with concentrations. Now, when we were doing this exercise, you know, we went back and forth several times with, with uh, Paul, Paul and Mike and, and at this point, I think I'd like to thank them for their continuous efforts and you know helping us out. But we we did, we found out that for some of the routes, uh, for example, dermal handling, and, and this has to do with how some of the the environmental, you know, products or or sources or media, uh, you know, uh, result in uh, phthalate exposures. The equations that we had to calculate you know es exposure estimates did not include concentrations. And what we determined was some of the numbers were really, really high. So what we decided to do was try to look at it from a slightly different perspective. So we decided to incorporate concentrations from, but the concentrations that we included were a fractional amount. So if you can think of it like a reduction factor. So concentrations were included in the equations, and the differences that you see between the two columns are a result of, if you include the concentrations, which is nothing but it reduces the numbers. So that's where we, we stand. Sorry. Uh, <clears throat> can you elaborate that a little um, t 
to, a, to an ignorant person like yes. myself, this is not immediately intuitive and ob obvious. Concentrations of what? Concentrations of phthalates in a particular product. For example, if I'm trying to assess the exposure that I will have if I hold this plastic pen, mm. I can look at the behavioral patterns like the amount of time in a day that I'm going to hold this and uh, you know, exchange the amount that will get transferred to my skin. That's one way to look at it. The other way to look at it is look at those and then multiply that times the actual amount of phthalate that might be present in this product. That's the co fractional concentration that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. So what you see in the column on the right-hand side excludes that amount, and the one on the left includes that. And, and the important thing over here is to see you know, the, the big difference. And, and we've kind of you know, gone back and forth about which is the, the, the best way. Our, our understanding so far is that certain cases, the ones with concentrations are, are better, and in some other cases, it might be better to use it without concentration. So I just decided to you know, present everything. Uh, going back to this one, Yes, yes, these, no, this, these are the average, I'm sorry. So, so basically this is the aggregate human exposure for um, an er the aggregate for, to the average from all different routes of exposure. Correct. So if we look at it on page 7, our graph here. My apologies. If we go back, we have table 2 on page 7 in chapter 10. So anything we'd be looking at for comparison would be related to a mean or an average, okay? Not for the 90th percentile. Trying to um, give us some foundation from which to operate. And it's aggregate. It's not for individual sources at this point. This is not disengaged to dermal versus ingestion. The fact that they're so, those two columns are so different, are you saying that it's going to be a case-by-case -case basis for us to decide which one of the columns to look at? Or is there one that's, I mean, is it large? I don't know. What, what you're saying. Um, wh I can show you some of the other uh, results that I have, and, and maybe at the end of the presentation it might be clear what to do. Uh, because I think that in certain cases, for the most part, the ones with concentrations, you know, make sense. The ones are the ones you, what you Maybe in a couple of circumstances, you may want to go with something else. But for the most part, you use the concentrations. With the concentrations. Yeah. It's, yeah. It, it, makes, it makes things a lot more palatable in terms of reality. Okay. So focus on the left for the most part and not on the right. Mike, is that that's what you and I Abs agreed Absolutely, on. yes. Yeah, we agreed upon that. In the final report, we're probably just going to focus on concentrations unless otherwise deciding that it would be worthwhile to include something else. The next table that I have over here kind of, co you know, compares our results with uh, the Wormuth paper. So uh, as Paul pointed out, and I should have mentioned that before, our results are the mean aggregate values, and the two columns on the right are the, the 50th and the 95th percentile values that Wormuth uh, estimated. And again, these are comparable because these are total aggregate, whatever, exposures per uh, kilogram body weight for women. And I have a, a, a graphic which kind of gives a better representation. So this is where we stand so far. This is like the overall thing. The three main ones that, that stand up are, are you know, about the same uh, that, that Warmoth also you know, found. The point is, is that this is for our mean. 95th percentile. So when you're looking at women of childbearing age, we've come with concentration data alone, which is which is where I came down on being the most logical thing to do. Wormuth is not representative. Where does that data come from? Wormuth? Pardon me? Where does the Wormuth data come from? German this German paper. I mean, but what population? I forgot. What, what's the population? It's Europe, I think. European. Yeah, European data. Yeah. It has actually various subpopulations. It includes children, infants, adults, women as well. 
So we've got a, his is, his is a little bit different than ours. It's about the best comparison we have because, again, his is modeling also. But his model estimates are much, much lower than the mean than what we have here. That's the point, is that he's missing something, but we can tell from our analysis. Do you know what's driving that major difference? <laughs> we'll show you in a few minutes. <laughs> we're, we're trying to, what I'm trying to do is, we're trying to keep us focused on the aggregate first because Chris was very concerned at lunch that we would be, you know, off in many, many different directions. What you're, what we're doing now is once we get this down to some degree of coherence, we can go and look and see, well, where is this coming from and why we're, why we're, we're seeing the differences. Is that, Chris, is that okay with you? I'm serious because um, y your points were well taken at lunchtime. Okay. Um, this kind of shows the differences um, of our overall aggregate results if we include concentrations and if we do not. So clearly, as I've mentioned before, the numbers without concentrations are, are significantly higher. Now let's look at what really is, is driving these things. Um, if you look at the, the pie chart on the left, that has the results with concentrations. And, you, and, and again, it's just... Let's, okay. see, let's talk about that primarily. Okay, all right. So roughly about 50% is DEP. About a little over 25% is, is DEHP. And then about 15 to 20% is DBP. And the others are kind of, you know, fractional amounts. Um, if we consider the three main, the, the th three phthalates that have the largest um, exposures, we then break it up according to what contributes. And you'll see over here, for example, for DEP, it's completely ingestion, ingestion direct, which is nothing but food and beverages. I'd like to point out here that we have the maximum amount of data for food and beverages right. that we've collected. Right. Well documented, good, good data, and it includes you know, things right from drinking water to beer and wine, alcohol, and all sorts of food categories. For DBP, it's dermal handling. Dermal handling, some of the things that contribute to dermal handling include the human interactions with things like plastics, furniture, uh, arts and crafts. Uh, you know, items for, for infants and children, things like that. And again, DEHP, it's, it's mainly uh, food and, and beverages that kind of drive, you know, the numbers. This comes... DEHP, I'm sorry, DEHP. I'm, I'm going to skip this because this is the result when we use, when we you know, do not use concentrations. But over here, you can just quickly say that it's mainly dermal handling that kind of drives the, and then ingestion indirect. Ingestion indirect includes only one uh, cosmetic product, which is lipstick, and it includes soil and, and dust. Um, and of course, dermal handling I mentioned some time back. Next, I'd like to, I'm sorry, Paul, did you have a question? Yeah, I think. Which were the routes that we were most insignificant? Cosmetics. Well, no, no. paints, which, which paints, paints, paints. So which for for each one of them, which which was the one that? Were, now, one there was one there was one or two routes that are in, trivial for all of them. I think it was paints, right? Paints, yes. Right. But again, the thing that I'd like to point out about paints is we had very limited concentration mm -hmm. data right. for paints, so that's. You know, statistically, it's definitely not that significant. And in each in each case, inhalation can be quite variable. In some cases, it's high. In some cases, it's non-existent. You know? To be honest with you, I was a little surprised. I, I thought inhalation would be higher. So did I. Yeah. But we yeah. were caught off guard, which again indicates that all these phthalates have... Um, different routes of entry based upon 
the way in which they evolve from the products and are used by people. We decided to create some you know, box plots. These, these show uh, the variability or, you know, this basically has the, all the exposures for the eight individual phthalates. It kind of gives you an idea of you know, how variable the data is, outliers, whatever. And I've also put, it, put the, the number of records that we have. So you can see in some cases the data is limited. For example, DIDP, I just have five exposure numbers. But that's the best that we could come up so far. Um, the the, the, the y-axis actually is you know, total exposure and all the units are micrograms per kilograms on a, on a daily basis. But I think what we're talking here is that one to three orders of magnitude difference. Correct, I yeah, think that's, that's, a, that's the most important thing to note there, that if you look at, look at this, it's one times 10 to the zero down to about um, minus five, seven. Ten, five, seven times 10 to the minus two in terms of median for You have a wide range of variability in terms of the exposure based upon the chemical alone. It's an awful large, large differential. That's a log scale, by the way. Yeah, right. The variability we see here is literally the same we see in the biomonitoring studies. At the bi I, I would agree that. The Variability is pretty consistent. Absolute magnitude, I'm not sure, are similar. Some of the numbers are surprising to me. Surprisingly high or low? Higher. Again, putting this into the context of what we're looking at, some of these chemicals much greater exposure and it all depends upon how it's distributed among these women in terms of the frequency and the distribution function of the actual final averages that uh, go with in terms of uh, a risk. This is very similar to the previous one, only over here the data is being categorized based right. on the different exposure routes. And again I have, you know, the number of records that we have. So, for example, pains is just four. On the other hand, ingestion, ingestion indirect, which is food, which I was mentioning some time back, 48. So that's, you know, better. Again, you see the same kind of, you know, variability. But, but the mean between these are not that different. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you take a look at the mean values, they're all, they're in comparison, they're all within one order of magnitude. Variability can be quite large because you have indirect and indirect, which goes from almost nothing to above one. But the mean is within about one to one and a half orders of magnitude. So the contributions from the different routes are equivalent, you know, given the uncertainties we're dealing with. Just a question are you talking about the results? We're talking. I'm trying, to I'm trying to interpret what he's saying because he didn't have, he did not have the, um, how you, the, the ability to hear what, where Holger and where Chris was coming from at lunchtime, and I'm trying to fill in some gaps. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Thanks, Paul. Um, and then I thought we could, you know, see you know, the different, uh, you know, exposure routes and see, you know, how the, the phthalates kind of, you know, uh, interact or what sort of numbers we get. So if you look at cosmetics, it's just two of them out of the eight. It's, it's mainly DEP and DBP. The others are, I mean, not even there. Again, paints, it's just two of them. So this kind of tells, gives us a little bit of, you know, idea of, you know, how sensitive some are to the, the routes in comparison to, you know, the others. 
Um, again, over here, we can mainly focus on the two graphs on the left-hand side because those are the ones with concentrations. Um, the one on top is dermal handling, uh, and the one below that is dermal internal, and the dermal internal is mainly, um, it includes adult toys, and it includes uh, medical devices. Um, so again, just a few of them stand out in comparison to the others. Ingestion indirect and ingestion direct on the left-hand side. And, and that's uh, what we've done so far. I mean, you know, we can clearly do a lot of analysis with the data. I mean, it's, it's really good. But, you know, I just wanted to give you all an idea of where we, you know, stand so far. Just a quick snapshot of the, the results. Uh, if if I, I'd li just like to add for a minute <clears throat> and thank you because I know that you have been working extremely hard on this and uh, uh, this is st it's still a work in progress and it, you know if you can imagine I mean I knew this was a big project but it's it's always bigger than I think and if you can imagine all the many steps in this search in the literature to get the input values and then to get the uh, exposure factors out and we're going through this sort of layer by layer and you know we I think we found the errors in the equations mm -hmm. like leaving out the concentration term or where the units didn't work out right um, and right now uh, we're looking at things uh, for example in the concentration data if there's you know, on a, one study that's driving it up or down. Uh, and also right now for some of the exposure scenarios, I know we have the right equations and the right uh, exposure factors, but I'm not sure all the, they're all applying, the, the exposure factors are being applied to the right scenario or vice versa. So, you know, I think we're, we're close, but I, these are definitely not final numbers. But that's why I wanted to go back to that one slide where we talked across the different routes. Could you go back to that one? Even if we aren't at the final version, I'm not going to see very much differential in terms of the median where each one of these routes reside unless there's some powerful study or a powerful set of data that we've ignored. Because right now it basically says that we have somewhat consistency across the different routes with a few being a little bit more important than the other. But um, it's going to be a matter of what the sources are that are going to be most important. That's where the variability, I think, is going to drive the analysis is, is the, um, the different types of sources that are contributing. Um, moving on to our ongoing efforts with infants, toddlers, and children, we kind of classified according to the age group. So we have infants up to, you know, one year, toddlers between one and three, and children from three to 12. Um, just a quick, uh, you know, update of where we stand so far. We have compiled most of the, the concentrations specifically for, for infants and children, and this is in addition to all the concentrations that we have for adults. Or, or women so far. Uh, we've also combined a lot of the, the exposure factors uh, for, for children. Uh, we, we have not yet done the calculations for the exposures, but we're very close. And, and we have some you know, really, really interesting questions that we've kind of come across. And, and you know, we would like to have the opportunity to you know, discuss them with, uh, with Mike and Paul. And, I don't know if this is the you know a right time, but I can maybe sure. showcase you know one yeah, example. Um, I'm actually going to open up a Word document which has a list of questions, but you know we can talk about one of them. This this relates to you know the inhalation exposure of infants and children. 
The thing that we have, we are currently having a difficulty with is we know exactly the, the human activity patterns of the behavior of women, but how does that translate to, you know, the exposure that a child is going to have or infant when, you know, the women holds the baby or nurses and, and stuff like that. So we know that, you know, it has to be a reduction factor, but how do we determine that? It's not something that's easily available in literature. We, we have to make some judgment calls. We've done a lot of literature search, we've consulted with people, but have not been able to come up with a good estimate. So, so those are, you know, some things that we, you know, need to address for, for this particular category. Um, you know, just as an example for fragrances, we have a number, you know, the number of times that, you know, somebody uses it, but then how does that translate to, how do we use that and say, okay, this is the amount that the, the infant would be, you know, exposed to as far as fragrances. Sort of like secondhand tobacco smoke. Or third, well, no, second. Child who's breathing in. Oh, breathing, the, but I'm breathing like the woman's clothes. Well, that would be tertiary, but secondhand would be the inhalation right. factor mm -hmm. where you have material that's being, you know, evaporated off the, off the woman's um, yeah, body. Definitely. So you have inhalation, secondary, and you're right, tertiary could be the, um, the amount that's from contact. Cooling, <laughs> you know, mouthing behavior. Yeah, so there's, that's a, that's a question, how, how we handle that. It is a real situation. All right, um, that's mostly what I have for today. You know, the, the things that, you know, need to be done, we need to, you know, review the data for what we've been doing so far with infants and children. And as Mike pointed out, we kind of need to provide the, you know, the, the finishing touches for, for pregnant women. Uh, the last category that we have to address are adults, which would include, you know, women and, and men. And then we need to also address, you know, the data quality issues. This is, you know, been a, a challenge, to say the least. We've tried to do a little bit with the results, but we kind of need to also do it with respect to, you know, the actual data, like the concentrations and even the exposure factors. So those are some of the, the outstanding things that, that uh, you know, need to be accomplished, and we're hoping that we can work very closely with, with Paul and Mike and, you know, address those things and ultimately finish this project. Yeah, one of the things, uh, questions I have for the chap is we started, you know, we said that the women of reproductive age would be the first priority, infants would be the second, and then farther down, uh, you know, maybe other, other children or in the general population. And I'm wondering, do we, do we need all of those? I mean, general population was our lowest priority. I'm not sure we even need it. I mean, I wrote it in to, to cover all our bases. I would think to speed the process of getting these things finalized, we drop the adults and only worry about women of childbearing age and infants, and, um, young children. Uh, is that Philip and uh, Brent, do you, do you feel comfortable with that? want to leave the adults in. I think, I think the pregnant women and, and children really parallel what we're doing in other parts of this mm -hmm. discussion, so I think that's, that makes sense. Okay. We've got parallelism throughout the report. Good. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, of course, Serge is doing the work. I think once you do the other scenarios, doing the general population won't be that hard. But, you know, if push comes to shove, we don't really need it. Yeah, and, and, and you know, we agree with that. The one thing that I'd like to point out, and I think we have not, we might have, you know, missed this, is have we thought about teenagers? Although women of childbearing age and pregnant women, they kind of, you know, a lot yeah. of the studies, they start really early, but teenage, boys, we've not really considered that. So I'm not, I'm thinking, should we also exclude them or? Well, 
I think when I wrote up the, the task, um, the thinking was that it's really prenatal exposures were the number one concern and then neonatal after that. And then, you know, probably the others, I mean, the, at least the thinking was that they are less important. Uh, and, you know, that's how we did it the way we did. Um, of course, teenagers are, in fact, still developing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, I guess I would just leave, I mean, that's, that's why we wrote the task the way we did. Um, but it's, that's really a, a question for the, the chap. You want to weigh in on this? I can tell. Probably also have to weigh the time aspect of prioritizing and not being able to get to months or. I was thinking in terms of. What would, if we had the data, say on teenagers, what would that add to our deliberations? It, has, it adds another whole large group of women who use cosmetics. Pardon me? In love. Maybe, maybe even more even cosmetics. More, right. So, what you're talking about in terms of exposure, you're talking about a very large um, user base. And within that, there's also logically some of them will be pregnant. So that part of it I might consider, but adults in general, I, I'd just ignore it. In, as far as teen, I don't know what the, you know, what the chap would do on the, uh, the hazard side. I mean, would you tr do that any differently? After having seen the interpretation of the first set data set on pregnant women, I would say we should first think about think talk about the data again and put it into perspective. And I think after that we might see that we don't really need to go further on that road. And the, uh, you know, in terms of the, the the bottom line as to whether to ban, or you know, uh, uh, deals with toys and childcare articles, and the way they're defined in the statute, toys means for kids up to twelve, or I guess it's up to and including, and childcare articles is up to three. So. That's actually my last slide, so I'm done. But um, if anybody has any questions, if you want to look at the data, I have the spreadsheets. I'm more than happy to show anything. So one question I have is based on the discussion at lunch, um, could you at least give us a top level view of how you went from all the different exposure routes to calculating a total? Absolutely. I'm sure there were assumptions you made there that I missed it because I'm. But. No, I, I did not address those details, but I, I can show you. Okay. Close this.
All right, so we begin by collecting the concentrations. So we have all the concentrations in the form of a database, if you might call it, where we have the phthalate, the exposure out, where it comes from, the media, the population that it addresses, and all the information that, you know, tells us where the data came from, how it was converted, and what the final units, what the final numbers are, and what the final units are. So this is the, the, the beginning. The next thing would be to look at the exposure factors, that is the human behavioral patterns. So if you see over here, all the data is categorized based on the different exposure routes. So if you look at inhalation, give you an example here. Um, what we have are numbers for things like what is the inhalation rate, and we have you know, detailed comments about how these numbers you know, were obtained. Most of them were obtained from the exposure factors handbook, and the handbook kind of, you know, gives a lot of details about, you know, the study that was done and ranges, variabilities, and things like that. So we have uh, certain important factors or parameters that govern the, the activities, the human activities. So we have them compiled over here along with our, you know, explanations. And then this data gets combined with the concentrations that we collected for that particular exposure out and that particular phthalate or media in, in an equation. And the equations were something that um, we worked very closely with, with Mike and Paul. For example, this is you know, the, the equation that we use for inhalation. And it tells you, you know, how we come up with daily exposures per given body weight. But how do you how do you get behavior in there? So not everybody has the same. How do you? Well, the behaviors and the factors handbook are categorized according to subpopulations. So the numbers that they have are, are for women of a particular age group, and they've done various studies of the different activities on a daily basis and come up with some characteristic numbers for the distribution. For the distribution. Yes, and that's and you know published by, by the EPA. Um, and so these get combined in another spreadsheet. I have that open. So for example, we have the concentrations over here for all the different phthalates that we have. This combined, and we've calculated the mean and the 95th percentile we have all the exposure factors that we obtained, and these all get combined in that equation to give us uh, daily inhalation exposure exposures in micrograms per kilograms per day. And we have two estimates here, one which uses the average concentration and the other which uses the 95th percentile value for the concentration. Now, we have done this for all the seven exposure outs, for all phthalates. What we do then is we kind of aggregate for each exposure out, we aggregate the numbers. So what, what this tells you is you don't have anything for DNOP or DINP, but these are some of the total exposure numbers for inhalation for all the phthalates uh, that, that we collected. So we do this and then the final step is to combine those aggregates across the different exposure outs and come up with this total number for each phthalate. So it's a step. So that's the, that's the table that we saw to begin with? with exactly, the yes, yes. So what if you were going to take that to a higher intake? You haven't so combined the 95th percentiles because, that, as I said, that have to be really, the main thing, I think, is to leave the 95th percentiles disaggregated because otherwise you're going to, you know, not everybody's going to have the 95th percentile of all the different routes of exposure. It just doesn't add up. You may have one or two, but the main thing is to show the distribution of the 95th percentiles across the different chemicals so that we know which ones can be most significant based upon the numbers that you get in each category. 
So based on your judgment, would you be able to come up with a ballpark figure for a high intake? Across the entire? Looked at different routes of exposure and said, you know, it's largely food here, so let's take the food and maybe, I don't. Well, you, can, you can do anything you want. I mean, the, the thing is that you can take the 95th percentile for food, and that will be a real number, I mean, a, a reasonable estimate. But do you add that to the 95th percentile for um, cosmetic ingestion? No. I don't think that would be reasonable. But didn't your tables, didn't you have a table that said for particular chemicals, it's largely, this one's 75 percent food and 25 percent cosmetic? That was, so mean, that, that was for the means, all right? All those the results are from the mean values. So we took the, the mean values and then calculated the statistics out the mean, of that. The mean values, you don't, you have plenty of wiggle room in the means. It's when you get to could the, you use the, the extreme same proportions for the extremes, the extreme values. Yeah, with you the could, but it would it would not make any sense because not everybody risk assessment the way it used to be done years ago is they say, well, who is the most exposed individual? Well, they put some lunatic on top of a hill. They'd eat nothing but hazardous waste. They'd drink nothing but hazardous waste. They would, they would breathe nothing but hazardous waste, and their offspring would be have three heads. It made no sense because there was no logic behind that risk estimate. What you have to do is base it upon the most probable route of exposure where a person may, in fact, be in the 90th percentile. For example, with with um, cosmetics. It would be a woman who would use cosmetics three, four, five, six times a day and do that every day or most days. And it would be a small percentage of the women who would do that. That would be your most exposed individual. But can I translate that and say that that woman would have the same high exposures for food? No. They may be a vegetarian. They may only eat organic foods. So they wouldn't get the high exposures. That's where the issue becomes one of coming up with numbers that are reasonable for one route. And if you want to translate to another, you have to come up with a case study that allows me to translate that to another, another venue. In the meantime, you could always say the woman who had the very high exposure to cosmetics would probably be around the mean with everything else, unless you have something else to say that would make it higher or lower. That's, that's where judgment comes in. But could, could it actually be, I hear what you're saying, that you're going to have, you know, green babies if you're not careful by having all the, the most. Um, but if the, if the most outrageous extreme case puts us in a, in a good p position relative to a reference dose, then we don't need to do further more look, right? Could we look at a very unreasonable worst case? And if, it, if it's close and if we're trying to create this margin of exposure table, and if it's still orders of magnitude um, below. below a reference dose, then we're okay. That, that's a different question. If you want to use it for a, a calculation to see, in fact, where your margin of safety is with respect to the extremes, you can always define that calculation according to that, the extreme numbers and just note this is not what we're assuming is an exposure to an individual, but this is something to see whether or not the, real, the reality of the most highly exposed individual could, in fact, exceed a reference dose. Yeah, you could do it that way. That's more than a reasonable thing to do. But again, that has to be couched that, you know, you don't take that number and, and run off with it in another direction. You're using it for a design value, which is fun. So it's a top tier number yes. that if it's, you know, if you really wanted to look further into it, you could make further assumptions and say, well, this is assuming you're high in one and not in the others, so right. it comes down to here. But I, I think just to, to For your purposes, a, that's fine. What you want to do, it's fine. You can, I, can, I can say that they could provide you with those numbers. Do you want to use the 95 <laughs> percent, 95th percentile? I think that's what we were, we're going to do. We we're going to do the 95th percentile. Mm -hmm. So that would work. We, I think we already have those numbers for women of childbearing age, right? Can you show them? I know we have those numbers. <laughs> by tip, by root, by root. Yeah. 
I can do a quick plot if you know that would illustrate it better. This is for dermal cosmetics. Red is, of course, ninety fifth. By Sally. Horizontal axis is phthalate? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the individual phthalates, and uh, that actually comes from here. Well, this is actually all <laughs> DEP. Those are, so, those are different products. Okay, yeah, the products are different, actually. These right, are, so yeah, this is that's by actually. One phthalate oops. for all different products. Yes, yes. Right, let's, get our, let's get our heads together. It's DEP. DEP by, only. By, by product. Yes. DEP? DEP and DBP, actually. There are two of them. You wanted the numbers? So if I, if I was going to create a high, outrageously high value for high intake estimates, what would I put in? Give me uh, okay, let's see. This, this, and that would be for DBP, uh, DBP found in deodorants from, or rather, you know, exposure to pregnant women from deodorants. And it will be 1.03 to the power minus one micrograms per kilogram body weight on a daily basis. Sorry, say it again, 1.0. One, e to the power, so point 0.1, point 0.1 micrograms. Sorry, but you're saying that's just deodorant. Yeah, yes, you, you can yes. sum them up for all. Let, let's that's what I'm asking. Can you do the sum for me? Just take, what you do is take the 95th. Yeah, I can, I can do this. Take that plot. Get the plot back up. Or can you just sum that column? Just yeah, sum the yeah, column, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I can do that. That's what I would do. Most outrageous for... Oh, not across chemicals, because you'd give it... This is this is per chemical. See, this is the total for cosmetics for DBP. High number, ninety fifth percentile, and this is for DEP. DEP. This is DEP. This is DBP. These are the numbers. So it's about about one. What's it about? Uh, point eight. Both are point eight. Right. Point eight micrograms. Micrograms per kilogram per day. But that's for just for cosmetics. Yes. Now, can you give me that with food and all the other things? Yeah, I would have and to. Then I could sum all those for the crazy case. Yes, that's yes. That, that's your worst possible possible possible. Want could it to I, be done? We could do that? that. Could you guys do that for me? No, we will do that for <laughs> you. Yes, yes, absolutely. Is that, is that what you want? Is that what your want? for your extreme value Margin. estimate? For a margin of exposure yeah. table? We could do that. That now? Yeah, we could probably, right? <laughs> can we do that now? Yeah, it would take me about six or seven minutes to do that, but I can, can do it. Can we take a break and let him do it and yeah. come yeah. back? It's a good time for a break. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we'll do it. Very good job, by the way. Oh, thank you, Paul. Superb. <clears throat> Thanks, Serge. This is 95th and this is 50th. And this is the total, these are the final numbers across all media, all exposure routes. And this is in terms of micrograms per kilograms per day. And just to kind of put it in perspective, if we take these numbers, if we multiply it by 70 kilograms, which is what we assume the average body weight would be, this would be the total exposure to phthalates in milligrams per day. Worst case scenario. And for DINP, it's not possible to calculate that. The, the reason I only did it for this is because these numbers, you see they are the same. The reason being, 
we added these concentrations later, so we did not calculate the the 95th. So the, we only have the means for that. So that's why I've just highlighted these. That's why you see the differences. There are no differences over here. Although I made changes to the, the calculations, that's because we don't have those, the 95th percentile concentrations for those. But, but again, I mean, you know, we can definitely make, you know, go ahead and change that. It would not be a significant difference to the overall because you see the, the f those three are the ones that really drive, you know, the numbers. Mm -hmm. Okay, what we're going to try to do now is get back to uh, our assessment of, of phthalates and um, our recommendations and uh, basically chemical by chemical. And we'll start with uh, analysis that Chris has done with um, a subset of the phthalates for which we have uh, the most data. And... Uh, I'll let Chris lead the discussion and her analysis that's been done on the fly. She's going to present that on, the, on this. So this actually comes from, I'm sorry about the table getting all mixed up, but this comes from um, Andreas's ideas this morning about trying to, um, I think, think more qualitatively and not so quantitatively, maybe as a first look at things. So the idea was to have some kind of a margin of exposure table um, based on a, a ratio of the reference doses to modeling. Um, this is now for the high intake, and then there's another table for the median intake. Two different versions, one from um, the modeling data and the other from the biomonitoring um, data that Holger and I have been working on, um, which is the 99th percentile from the NHANES data. So the, the next two columns there that are actually squared off um, is just that rate, those corresponding ratios. And then we were trying to make it more simple. I think I would propose to get rid of those next two columns, but just so you could see the calculation, the last two columns that are all looking funky um, are trying to get to an idea of how many orders of magnitude above, um, you know, between the high intake estimate and the reference dose. So if you agree the way we calculated that, and I guess we could do that different ways, but so for example, um, DEP had a, suppose we use a reference dose of 7,500. Um, the modeling exposure had 582, so the ratio of 7,500 7, to 582 is actually 13, and we would say that's the rounded margin of exposure of one order of magnitude or 10, or should we say, I'm not sure what that column should be. Um, so do we call that a 10 or a? Just a little thing. Um, you've, you've based this on uh, reference doses. It should be points of departure. Margin of exposures are calculated in relation to points of departure. Oh. Well, so in all cases, it would be a factor of 100 off. Because we've used the uncertainty factors of 100 all the way down. And you have to be. You have to say that we made up the RFD of the DEP. Right. So DEP may not be the good place to start. Those are ordered based on um, um, molecular weight. So that was why it's at the top of the table. Um, but would you like for me to recalculate them, or can you look at it this way, or? So, but Andreas, my question for you is, um, based on your discussion this morning, is that, uh, ignore that the, the last two, you know, the margin of exposure columns, just look at the rounded margin of exposure columns. If those were corrected based on actually a point of departure compared to um, the high intake values, is that the kind of feel that you were after, that there are some chemicals that are much closer and others that are further apart, and that might give us some <coughs> guidance about where to go? which isn't, so there's a lot of variation, a lot of unknowns, a lot of all of that, but at least it's ballparks, which may be a good place to start. <coughs> there, are, there would be cases when we could maybe have some information about um, 
hazard indices, but otherwise we, this is, so it seems to me, I mean, I guess we have to figure out what kind of margin of exposure we're interested in if you multiply those by 100 each. But there are some pretty. So how do you want to use this? Explain margin of exposure will work. Um, so Andres could probably address that better than I, but um, the idea was that um, I think if we focus in too narrowly on just looking at a hazard index or a hazard quotient, how close is it to one, there are so many things that can go up and down based on different behaviors, different, cha you know, different um, substitutions and things that we don't have access to. So the idea was to look at things at least maybe beginning more qualitatively and not so quantitatively. So although we're looking at numbers, we're trying to be ballpark numbers here. There's something else wrong there. Can, can I ask for five minutes interruption to? To fix it? Yeah, shall we do that? Yes. Okay. 